something else we'll get started in Romans chapter 5. We're in verse 17 today, verse 17 through 19, Lord willing, we'll look at. So. We had been beginning back in verse 12, really, we saw how that by sin, Adam sinned in the garden, and death and sin came upon all men. And then in verses 13 through 17, we've been looking at this parenthetical statement that Paul puts here to kind of give us some explanation and clarity on the subject. We'll finish up that now in verse 17. He says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace of the gift, their hand of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Here, if you recall from our last lessons, we've been looking at the comparison of what we received in Adam and what we receive in Christ. How that he describes Adam as a figure of him which was to come in verse 14. That is, both are representative heads of groups of people. So they are antitypes, though, in a, in a sense as well, that we receive sin and death through Adam. We receive, we receive life and righteousness through Christ. But in verse 17, he says, Here, for if by one man's offense, again, Adam's sin in the garden, his transgression there, this is why, I hope you've seen, this is why the historical Adam is important, because without the account of Adam and Eve in the garden, if that's not true, then that throws off really the whole rest of God's word. That's right. Yeah. But Paul is heavily basing his arguments here about justification and life and righteousness and all these things that we receive in Christ and the fact that we receive the opposite in Adam. If evolution is true, then we then death and suffering are just a byproduct of that evolutionary process. But if God's word be true, then sin is the cause of all those things. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. <clears throat> that is, as we saw back in verses 12 through 14, that sin or death came because of sin, and sin reigned, really has reigned ever since then, but it, even before the law of Moses was given, death reigned. Because one, we received the sin nature from our father Adam. It's been passed on from generation to generation. <coughs> The only person I know that didn't receive that was Christ because he was not born of man. But we also we know that because Adam and Eve took the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they lost their innocence, and thus we did as well. It's hard to imagine, but Adam and Eve, before that fall in the garden, they were purely innocent before God. We think of little children as being innocent. And in some senses they may be, but they are not that pure innocence that Adam and Eve had. Even little children have been corrupted by sin. If you don't believe that, you must not erase children very much because they know when they do wrong. They, scriptures even speak of some that come forth from their mother's womb speaking lies. So even what we think of innocence isn't even in comparison to what Adam and Eve had before the fall. And yet we all lost that when they partook of that tree. We all became partakers of knowledge of the tree of good and evil in them. I think you can't go to even the most remote villages of South America and find that there's not some standard of right and wrong among those people. Now, of course, man's Understanding of right and wrong has been corrupted by sin. Depravity has skewed his understanding of God's law. But as we saw, I think it's back in chapter 2 of Romans, the law of God was written on man's heart. 
that man is accountable for God because he has this basic understanding of right and wrong because he inherits also the sin nature from our father Adam. So he says here, by one the man is offense, death reigned by one. And he says much more. Again, we have this comparison of Christ and Adam. And we contrast what we receive in Adam and what we shall receive in Christ. How that, yes, we receive things of great magnitude in Adam, but we receive even greater things in the person of Christ. He says, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. That is, you can be sure if you're saved, you experience abundance of grace. For by grace are you saved is our motto oftentimes, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we received abundance of grace because he, just simply because he saved us and not even counting all the blessings that we've received since then, but and then he goes on saying the gift of righteousness. You can be sure righteousness is a gift of God as well. You know, some people, they they think they can be righteous in their own selves. They have this self-righteousness that they trust in, much like the Pharisees did. And yet you can't stand righteous in front of God by your own doing. No, God's standard of righteousness is far greater than anything that we can attain to. That is why it is a gift of God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I don't think we have to go rehash all of chapters 3 and 4, but we cover that pretty extensively, how the righteousness and justification only come by faith in the person of Christ. That our sins are imputed to his account, and his righteousness is imputed to our account. That is, he takes our sin upon him, and he gives us his righteousness. That is the gift of righteousness that comes by Christ. And he says, those that have received this abundance of grace and gift of righteousness, he says, they shall reign by <clears throat> reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Although I'm willing to have you to believe that right now we're reigning with Christ, and that's all there is to it. But I think there's far more to reigning with Christ than just what we have in this life currently. Certainly, in a sense, we reign with Christ now. I mean, sin and death don't have dominion over us anymore. We'll see that when we get into chapter 6 later on. But Satan certainly has a great power, but he can never defeat us. So yet we only see, really in part, what we shall see later on. But we have... Christ certainly is willing to reign over this world and the fact that he is the sovereign God of the universe, but one day he will literally reign on this earth. Revelation chapter 20 tells us this. Uh, turn over there real quick. Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6. On such the second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And we have this period we call the millennial reign to look forward to when it says we shall live and reign with Christ. I don't seek to make that metaphorical or symbolic because yes, Christ is very much in power of this world today, but he is not ruling and reigning from the throne of David like he promised he would one day. But he tells us that we shall reign with him. 
I don't know what all that's going to entail. In some places, it seems to indicate that we might rain over certain parts of that new world there. But you can be sure there is much more to reigning with Christ than just what we experience in this life. What we have in Christ now is only a, a small glimpse of what we will experience in eternity with Him. Because one day, sin will be banished forever. One day, death will be no more. One day, Satan will be cast in the lake of fire to spend all eternity there. One day, this corruptible body will put on incorruption, the scriptures say. This mortal will put on immortality. Then shall we pass the same death to swallow up in victory. Amen. See, we, we possess those things in Christ now that we shall realize them fully in the future. That's why I said, yes, we, in a sense, reign with Christ now that we shall experience that more fully in the future. I think the big point that Paul is driving home here in this comparison, this contrast, if you will, is that through Adam, death reigned. Through Adam, death, suffering, and pain, and all that goes along with it has ruled this world. And yet, one day in Christ, all those things shall be done away with, and we shall experience life everlasting. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, we will experience that place where death is no more, where sin is no more, where yeah. Satan is no more. Uh, and that will be the fulfillment of reign of Christ in life. No, as I mentioned, verses 15, well, really verses 13 through 17 have all been this parenthetical statement. But, and specifically, verses 15 through 17, he's been kind of giving some historical, excuse me, rhetorical statements. You know, he's saying, if we receive this in Adam, then we're going to receive this in Christ. If Adam's transgression you know, was of such great magnitude that it caused death and condemnation of all, then how much greater is what comes through Christ. But then in the remainder of the chapter, he gives some more assertive statements here. We'll, we'll go on to verse 18. He says, therefore, this is going back to verse 12, where he says, wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world, and death by a sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because of that, he says, therefore, by the offense of one that is, again, Adam's transgression in the garden. By the fence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That is, we were all condemned in Adam. So this goes along with verse 16, where he says that judgment was by one to condemnation, but free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Adam's one Transgression condemned us all, but Christ's obedience, he gives us justification in life and righteousness. It says in verse 18 there, he says, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That is why Christ did not come to the world to condemn the world, John 17, or 317, excuse me, but John 318 says that we are condemned already because we believe not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Christ did not need to come in the world and say, oh yes, you're, you're going to go to hell now. We were already going there on our own. Certainly he said things such as, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Certainly he told us the reality of hell. But Christ didn't need to come in the world just to, to condemn mankind. He said he came to save. Right. Amen. Amen. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. It was his mission. And that either he accomplished that or he did not accomplish it. Depending on your theology, you might not think he completed that, but I'd say, well, certainly he obtained redemption, eternal redemption for us on the cross. Hebrews teaches that very plainly. You know, we were condemned in Adam as our head, if you will, in verse, the next part of verse 18 says, even so by the righteousness of one, that is Christ, and his perfect righteousness, this, there is no other that has been as righteous as Christ, and no other that 
can be as righteous as Christ was and is. The Pharisees thought they could be righteous enough to please God, but even their righteousness was not enough. I think there are many today that are trusting in their own righteousness under the guise of good works, but they're going to find out one day that those good works were not enough to save them. And it's only by the righteousness, the righteousness of one that the free gift can come, as he calls it here. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. It is the gift of eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord. He says it came upon all men on justification of life. You know, the universalists would say that this means all will be saved. When he says it came upon all men, that means they all we all receive salvation whether you believe or not. The others would say that means salvation is available unto all. And there's others again that would say, well, it means salvation is available to all types of men, you know, of every nation, tongue, kindred, tribe. But I think we must remember that he is speaking here of Christ and Adam as representative heads. All that were in Adam received condemnation. All that are in Christ received this free gift of justification unto life. It is just as in Adam we die and in Christ we live. Said so he is speaking here of that they are a figure. That Adam is a figure of Christ. That Adam was our representative head there in the garden, and Christ is a representative head on the cross as well. That all that are in Christ will most certainly live. I think. You might say, well, how do we know that we're in Christ? If you believe on Lord Jesus Christ, then you are in Christ. Well, we could get into the, the details of that and what it means, but either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. There's no gray area. There's no hope so, maybe so. When I get there, I'll find out type of salvation. It's either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. Either you're in Christ and eternally secure in Him, or you're out of Christ. And as Paul describes in Ephesians, that you're without God and without hope in this world. Again, the comparison here is Adam as our head and Christ as a, our head. Adam is the head of a certain group of people and Adam is the head of a certain group of people. All that are in Adam sinned and fell in condemnation with him and all that are in Christ receive his righteousness and life and all that goes with that. Verse 19, he goes on again to say, for as by one man disobedience, once again, Adam's transgression, his disobeying the, the one commandment he had of God. He says, by that one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. When Adam countless billions became sinners, I don't know how many people have lived from Adam to now or will until the end of the world, but at this point, we could say it's billions, if not trillions, of people. And he says many of those, many were made sinners. But on the contrast, he says so by the obedience of one, that is the obedience of Christ, the obedience to the law and to the cross. The obedience to the law made him the perfect sacrifice, the lamb without blemish, the one without sin or guile or any fault found in him. And it was obedience to death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2 tells us that that is what brought about our life. In Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8, we don't have to turn there, but it, it tells us that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I think it's interesting to note that Hebrews 5, 8 says that he learned to be obedient. I know God is all-knowing, Christ being God, he is all-knowing as well, but he had never experienced obedience until he came in the flesh. But it's not that he learned something new necessarily, but that he had to submit himself to that obedience. 
the obedience to the law, to the will of God, but he had to submit himself to partake of that cup, even though it was going to be very grievous as he prayed in the garden. If, if it be possible, take, let this cup pass from me. Yet we know it was not possible, and he learned to be, in that sense, he learned to be obedient, even unto death. We need to learn that same type of obedience, though, don't we? But it's by his obedience, it says, obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I don't profess to know how many people are, have been and will be saved, but he says here that just as many, or as many people have died in Adam, ascended in Adam, so shall many be made righteous and live in Christ. I'm not saying it's going to be 50-50. I don't think history or scripture bears that out, but you can be sure it's going to be more than just a handful, as seems like sometimes we act like. And when he says we shall be made righteous, he's not saying that we shall be self-righteous. He doesn't mean that we will going to become perfect and without sin, but we shall receive that imputed righteousness of Christ. We can stand before God righteous because we are in Christ. I think that's what many professing Christians miss today is that God sees us in Christ. Or as the psalmist said, we are accepted in the beloved. <laughs> that it's through the person of Christ that God views us. And if you're not in Christ, then you don't have that mediator, if you will. You don't have that one to say, yes, he is righteous through me. If you're not in Christ, then you will stand before him with all your guilt, with all your sin, with all your supposed self-righteousness. Sadly, you'll be found guilty before God. He says, all those that were not written in the lands of life shall be cast in the lake of fire. This is the second day. That is what awaits all those who are not in Christ. That's what awaits all those who remain under the condemnation of Adam. Yet we have so much to be thankful for in the person of Christ. That we receive life and righteousness and justification, those are just three of the big ones. But there's so much more that we receive in the person of Christ. And we'll, Lord willing, uh, next lesson, we'll look at verses 20 and 21, and we'll see again about the law. He tells us, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And when we really see ourselves as the sinners that we are, we'll realize how precious that is. That our sin was great, but God's grace is greater. But the condemnation we had in Adam was great, but the justification that we receive in Christ is greater. Amen. But the death we received through Adam is devastating, but yet the life we receive in Christ is far greater than that. Yeah. But the condemnation we received in Adam is certainly the most awful the condemnation we get the righteousness that we receive in Christ will far exceed that combination. So you, I think some people, when they lose that doctrine that we call original sin, they forget how wicked and vile we really were in the sight of God. You no, know, in Adam we, were, we deserve to go to hell. In Adam we deserve to die. In Adam we deserve eternity separate apart from God. In reconciling us to him and bringing us back into a good standing with him again, we receive the opposite of all those things. We saw that back earlier in the chapter, how they, Christ, through his, through his death, reconciled us unto him. He brought us back into good standing with God again. Yet all of it is simply by his grace because we didn't deserve any of it. We didn't we deserved all that we received in Adam because we follow right after his same sinfulness. That's I know some that 
our opponents to what we call original sin, they say, well, that's not fair. You can be sure that your own sin will condemn you just as much as your sin nature condemns you. That we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God is a universal truth. That we've all fallen very short of the mark which God requires. And yet, in Christ, he freely gives it to all those who believe. He freely gives his righteousness. He freely gives justification. He freely gives life, eternal life even. Should we not be eternally thankful and grateful to him for what he has done for us? So that's just a glimpse of the things we receive in Christ. We get everything that we receive in Adam, Christ, is so much greater for us. Yeah. We that are saved need to thank him and praise him for those things. And for you that are not saved, all they do is point you to Christ because if you're outside of Christ, you'll stand guilty before God. You'll be, you're already under condemnation, he says, and you will remain under that condemnation until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to close with that thought.